Hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, we are going to be presenting uh, some of our research that we've been doing for the past year. Um, and the title of the talk is Checking Out the Internet from Rural Libraries. These are some of the images um, from Maine and Kansas from the libraries that we've been visiting for the project. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Um, we'll just start off, obviously, by introducing ourselves. So I'm a new faculty member at SLIS. My name is Colin Reinsmith. And um, some of the work that I look at is uh, gen generally within the field of social and community informatics, but um, really largely interested in issues related to digital inequality, or what, what's been called also digital equity. How do we achieve digital equity in the role of public libraries and other community-based organizations to uh, address the digital divide? So there's a lot of the um, a lot of what my research and teaching, teaching focuses on. Hi, I'm Madison. Um, I am a second year SLIS student. I'm graduating in May and um, my focus is more in youth services, uh, specifically for teens in public libraries, as well as opportunities for digital literacy training in public libraries as well. Um, great. So, um, so just a little overview of what we'll be talking about today. Um, so the, the research project, um, again, is looking at these devices, really. So when we talk about these little wireless uh, hotspot lending programs, this is something that's been um, increasing in libraries in terms of having these types of programs over the last couple years. It's been, it seems like we hear more and more about these types of programs. But we're really, obviously, we're looking at rural libraries, which is um, something we feel that is, uh, well, certainly, when we received the grant, which was in 2016, last year, I guess, early last year, um, was understudied. So it was a pretty new area for libraries to begin getting into this area of mobile hotspot lending. And so, um, as you can see here, so we're looking at 24 rural libraries in Kansas and Maine. And the reason why it's Kansas and, and, and Maine is we're working with um, a research team that's also located at the University of Texas at Austin and Oklahoma State University and Dr. Sharon Strover, who is the principal investigator on the grant, um, has been working with the New York Public Library. Um, so she has been working on the sort of the urban component of this project. And the funders who funded that grant said, um, well, it's great to know how the New York Public Library does it, but what about the rest of the country? And so that's, um, that's how we got the idea to um, look at Kansas and Maine because the, um, essentially what they wanted to do, um, or essentially what they did is they connected with the Maine State Library and the Kansas State Library to, um, to set up the program in rural areas. So that's how the project kind of came to be, so to speak. And uh, so we applied for an IMLS grant and it's funded for a year and a half. And so it's kind of fun to be distributed now across the country and it's obviously um, it's nice for us to be closer to Maine, and then um, folks in, uh, in uh, down south are closest to, closer to Kansas, so uh, they're working looking at those aspects. Um, so a couple pictures here of um, uh, some of the libraries that we're working with, and um, that's the next slide here. Great, so um, everybody knows what a hotspot device is, I imagine, for the most part. Um, so, um, so that's... Uh, the key really in what we're finding, actually I'm just going to close this here, is obviously um, you need to be close to a uh, tower, right, in order to get a signal. So that's really the, the key and, and it's actually been one of the challenging parts of the project, particularly in rural areas when we're dealing with rural infrastructure, um, that, that can be one of the challenges, but that's really uh, obviously the most important thing about it, but you know, I think it's, it's again, it's, uh, um, well, we'll talk more about sort of the implications for libraries and what it means for libraries to do this type of work, but really this is, this is what we're studying. Yeah, so um, where we're studying them, so this is the map of Maine, so there are six libraries uh, that are all in Washington County, Maine, so it's in the northeastern -est most part of the United States, it's where the Sun rises on the U.S. They like to they call it Sunrise County, Washington County, and uh, just a beautiful part of the country. If if any of you have been up to Maine or spent any time, so you see Bar Harbor is here, and then you know we're talking really at the border of Canada. So it's it's very far um, east. Uh, obviously, there's the whole rest of Maine as you can see here, but this is a nice little indication of where it is. So those are the six libraries that essentially. Um, so they were contacted again by the Maine State Library. 
uh, to participate. So they kind of agreed to participate in this program. Great. Yeah, so um, the Washington County economy is pretty specific to that area. Um, it's, it's a very seasonal economy, so you've got the, the blueberry farming, which makes up um, a huge part of the economy in this county. They produce about 80% of the nation's blueberries just in this county alone. So um, 80% of the world's. Yes, 80% of the world's blueberries. I'm sorry. So it's a huge, huge uh, part of the economy up in Washington County. Um, and then lobster fishing and fishing in general. A lot of the communities along the coast of Maine are sort of small fishing-based communities. So that's a huge part of it as well. Uh, and then in the winter, wreath making is a big um, component sort of, of how people get by in the winter, which is really challenging in a seasonal economy. Uh, so we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But they also have a huge migrant population of people who come in for the summer months through November when they start to trickle out and go into other areas. So that's a huge part of how um, all of these industries sort of keep functioning over time. So some of the challenges in Washington County uh, based on, on that economy and just sort of how, how it works up there is that um, the unemployment rates are really high. Uh, a lot of uh, individuals are doing this sort of manual labor, the farming, the fishing, and things like that. And uh, there's a lot of substance abuse and addiction in this area as well. So you, you see a lot of um, poverty, you see a lot of um, unemployment up in Washington County, which uh, contributes a lot. Yeah, so this is a, a, a couple pictures of the um, of the PVD Memorial Library in Jonesport, and um, just to give you sort of a flavor of, of the types of rural libraries in this area, um, and this is one of the libraries that we actually had a chance to visit, which was really great. Um, since our team, again, is distributed, um, we're sort of divvying up the travel and sort of who goes where uh, based on people's schedules, but we, uh, Madison and I, had an opportunity in fall, which was beautiful when we went up, um, had more color than Boston, so it was really nice to go up at that time um, to visit the library, talk with the librarian uh, who was there. We were actually went out to try to do a focus group with people who had actually checked out the hotspots. Obviously, we're looking at that as well, um, but unfortunately, um, it's been for, it's been very challenging actually to try to get um, to talk with folks who have had experiences checking out the hotspots because I mean I think there are a number of reasons. One. Um, from what we've learned from the librarians, um, people just don't have time to come out and talk with us. You know, they're busy people, oftentimes working a couple of jobs, trying to make ends meet. Um, also, you know, we're outsiders, we're dropping in from, you know, outside of the area, and so there's trust issues, like who are, who are these strange people that wear funny hats and want to talk with us. So um, it's, been, it's been really hard, actually, to talk with users in Maine. We've had a little bit more luck. We'll share some findings from the focus groups that our team has done with folks in Kansas, but um, so far we haven't had much luck at all talking with folks in Maine. So, um, but anyway, so these are some of the pictures from uh, from this library. And um, so, doing a sort of a hard <laughs> transition to um, to Kansas now, shifting. Not much of a segue there, but um, so this gives you an idea of the sort of distribution of the libraries across the state of Kansas. Anybody been to Kansas or from Kansas before? Um, yeah. Um, so you can see literally all the way across the map. Um, I was really fortunate that I had an opportunity to visit southwest Kansas. It's you know, extremely rural in terms of uh, the landscape. I'll show a couple pictures in a minute in terms of uh, certainly challenges with infrastructure, but, um, uh, in, in, but also in terms of uh, population. So this is the, uh, you know, obviously Kansas City is up here. So there's, you know, for those of you who probably know, so there's Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas City, Kansas. So this is obviously Kansas City, Kansas here, and so our team uh, visited a lot of the uh, suburban libraries that were right outside of, um, of Kansas, but, you know, starting to get rural as well. So, uh, but when you get, you know, down here to Southwest, um, even though these are serving counties and not necessarily towns, so there's a different sort of, you know, government structure and organizational structure, um, still the towns in which they're located are, you know, population size of, you know, anywhere between, you know, it tends to hover mainly around 2,000 people, so very small towns. Um, so, uh, so that was last summer, had an opportunity to visit um, Stanton County Library, and we're going to be talking a little bit more about that library as well today. So, so this gives you a, a sense of the, um, uh, well, topography, I guess. Pretty flat, 
Um, and uh, you know, you can just see for miles and miles. It's beautiful. Uh, it's really, really nice. Um, but you know, it really again, this is really where it matters. And the success of these programs really rely on on the infrastructure and where the the towers are located. So um, that again, you know, if for for counties that are checking out the hotspots to patrons, it matters where in the county they are because some people might have a good experience with the device versus other people who are just in you know one part of the county that's just too far away from the um, tower are going to have a, a harder time connecting. So that's really been one of the main sort of takeaways so far that we've been uh, learning from this program. But this just gives you a sense of what it looks like in that part of the state. Yeah, so to spotlight Stanton County Library for a minute, uh, this is the county library for all of Stanton County and it serves about 2,300 people. Um, so it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty small population, but in terms of the hotspot devices that they circulated, the number was really high relative to the, the size of the community. So um, we like to talk about it as sort of a successful program that we saw doing this work. Um, the, so Stanton County also has a pretty high migrant population. They'll, they'd see a lot of migrant farm workers coming in um, during harvest season, and so they actually have an outdoor place, um, like benches and seating outside of their library that's open 24 hours, so people can connect to the library Wi-Fi from outside. So they definitely saw that need for, for Wi-Fi connections outside of the library. And so they started out with eight devices during their um, this sort of state-funded program, and then uh, they actually, um, because of their numbers, the library director applied for another grant and got it, so she was able to fund another 15 devices after that, um, just to sort of continue the program. And uh, they also said that they had a really um, good, smooth relationship with the internet service provider as well, um, so all in all the program um, was really, it was sort of effective for them in that community. Yeah, and I should, I should just add too that one of the things, unfortunately, we didn't include in our presentation, but we're interested in sort of maps of access, you know, where is access available. Um, so that's uh, definitely part of the project, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the outputs from this research. But one of the things that we've um, said that we do is, is to really provide a, as accurate as possible a map of the coverages in these areas to also then help us understand um, the impact on these checkout programs as uh, something that other libraries should think about as they're doing these types of programs. Yeah, so um, so now I've just sort of given you a, sort of an idea of uh, the landscape and, and literally the landscape, but also some of the libraries and, and what we're looking at. You know, these these are the core questions. These are this is really what we set out to learn, and it was really these four areas. So obviously, just the sort of practical you know aspects of the program. What does it mean? Um, you know, how, how does it work? How do we do these programs, particularly for rural libraries, considering these uh, access and availability issues? But also, we want, obviously want to understand what the impact of these devices are. I mean, one of the things that's um, really interesting is that a number of libraries, well, libraries in general, um, when they think, when they start thinking about these programs, they say, well, what should the um, uh, the checkout periods be? What should the loan periods be? And you know, so for example, the New York Public Library example, it was a year. So they gave everybody a device for one year, which was a really long time. Uh, versus some of the libraries that we're looking at in, in Maine and Kansas, in um, I don't know if you remember. I have to help me. I get them confused, but I think that in in Maine it was a month, I think, and then in Kansas it was seven days. So there are real questions around sort of you know what. You know what is a measurable impact from a from a, um, a lending of a device like this? You know what can we really measure in terms of impact in seven days? Like you know what? Yes. I don't know if you're getting or if you're going to get to this, but um, yeah, were the people using the hotspots were they people that didn't have internet access at home, or like what were they typically being used for, or like for? traveling around with the hotspot? Yeah, like we'll, we're going to talk about that in oh, a minute, okay. actually, gotcha. about some of the findings. So okay. what we've, um, so yeah, so no, those are great questions. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. But those are real questions, I think, as a library sets out to do a program like this, is, um, you know, what is the need? A lot of, in Maine, for example, the framing for the program, the, the case that they made for why they should do this, was around addressing the homework gap. So it's a lack in access that kids have between, um, you know, having access at home and not having access at home. Obviously, in order to do their homework, if they have access, it helps them to um, do their homework at home. Versus obviously be relying on public libraries and schools to fill that uh, fill that gap. So Maine was very interested and continues to be interested in addressing the homework gap with these devices. 
whereas Kansas didn't have those same. So then it was focused on kids and you know school age kids in Maine, whereas Kansas didn't have that same focus. They weren't focused on um, only serving kids. They really opened it up to anybody. So anybody who came in could could check out advice. So that's an important part of the program uh, in understanding programmatically what their focus is. Um, but then we had you know broader questions on number three here, just the you know, what does it mean then, the role of libraries in the sort of rural information ecosystem? What that basically, one way to sort of interpret that, that is, you know, how do other stakeholders in the community see their library? Like, do they value the library? Do they see it as an important component of people's access to information in rural communities? So we really, so we did interview a number of other stakeholders, not just librarians and patrons, but also Really, I mean, all kinds of people from local bus business owners to um, local government folks to I internet service providers to really try to get a sense of what this information ecosystem is like and then what role the libraries are playing to kind of within that ecosystem. And then lastly, um, oh, I'm sorry, that kind of gets to the last part too. <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, and then sort of what the relationships are between, between those different groups. And that matters because, you know, we wanted to know um, you know, does a rural library have to work with a school in order to have these programs be successful? Like, who else is really um, helpful or, or dependent um, uh, on in order for these programs to work? So that's just a sort of overview of some of the things that we um, told the IMLS that we would work on for this project. Yeah, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the findings, and this kind of gets into what you were asking a minute ago. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one thing that we found out in both Kansas, a lot of these are going to overlap between the two communities. So in Kansas and Maine, um, most people found out about the hotspots through word of mouth. Um, there were, um, you know, Facebook posts by the library in some cases, which of course if people didn't have internet at home they might not have seen. Um, they would have posters in the community centers and sort of gathering places, but in general people said that the way that they find, found out was either hearing straight from the librarians or hearing it from their friends that this program was available. So um, that's sort of how people got, got interested in the hotspots in the first place. Um, in general, they were used um, for a lot of things, but travel, taking the hotspot on a, a, a trip, so sports teams at the high schools would take them to varying degrees of success with that. And then um, if families were traveling or going somewhere remotely, they would take them. Um, there's um, also sort of keeping up to date with the family and community, and that sort of gets into people who didn't have internet in their homes in the first place. So sometimes we would take them out, even if they had internet, just to be able to take it on a trip. But um, a lot of people would take it and use it at home so that they could be um, home using the hotspots to you know, fill out job applications, keep up to date on the news, Skype with their family members, uh, you know, go on Facebook, that sort of thing. Um, we also saw people uh, mentioned in the focus groups using um, Facebook or Etsy to do like, to like sell crafts or to sort of you know, start small businesses in that way. Um, pay bills, all kinds of stuff. So people used it for a, a lot of different purposes um, and generally using it at home was so that they could be, um, they don't have to be in the library to use the internet so they don't have internet services in their house. Um, and people also mentioned that they appreciated that for the privacy aspect as well. They felt more comfortable um, doing some of their searches at home and not on a public computer. It also um, helped and had a, had a relationship with the one-to-one -one program in the schools, which is uh, when all of the students enrolled. Um, most, it was in K-12 through 12 for, for most of the schools uh, that we talked to. Um, they, every student in those schools would get um, an electronic device, iPads or laptops generally. Um, so that was really awesome. So for kids who um, don't have internet in their home, but they have their laptop and their school is using digital textbooks, which is often the case, um, they were able to take their computers home and use the internet with the hotspot device as well. Uh, there were um, mention of data throttling issues. So if you get one of these hotspot devices every month, um, they said that they were unlimited, but if someone who used that device before you used a lot of data, it's possible that that device would then be slower or not functional by the time that you received it. So that's something that they, a lot of people mentioned as a complaint that they had about the program was that they couldn't really get um, a firm answer from their service providers about you know why the data was being throttled, but they were facing that despite um, assurances that the devices were unlimited. Yeah, and I can add one point to that too. Um, and this was in Maine in particular that um, they didn't necessarily have access to a dashboard where they could monitor or see how much data were left for that month. So if somebody brought back in, you know, the device, but there was still data left, um, you know, they didn't know what they could really promise to people who came in to check it out. So that was a huge issue. 
the other issue is that um, you know they're so they're basically so they're data caps on these devices, and the throttling happens when the, you know they reach the data cap. So the problem is, are you, then you know what can these devices really be used for is the other question, and I think that the libraries that were more successful were able to articulate those technical aspects to patrons just so they give them a sense of um, you know, what was possible. You know? So rather than you know, saying, you can all go home and stream Netflix or something, which is, you know, obviously they're not going to get very far with that. But if it's you know, to ch ch um, check a device out to write a term paper or something like that, that's, you know, that's fine. So there was one of the, you know, the things that we learned, but it was additionally, as Madison was saying, it was, it was challenging for some of the libra libraries that they couldn't see you know, in terms of understand how much data was left was one of the challenges for the libraries. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and in Kansas specifically, it seemed like they had a little bit more leeway in terms of the amount of data that they were using and, you know, being able to stream video clips and things like that. They're, I think their relationship with their particular service provider allowed for more of that. In Maine, you couldn't stream more, you know, if you tried to stream an hour of video, it would, it would stop working. Um, and it would use, the device, use up the data and the device for the entire month for everyone. So that was definitely a problem. Um, and then, uh, like we were talking about with the sort of layout of Kansas and the geography, um, the devices were often, um, people mentioned that they were more reliable um, than their cell phones or the satellite dishes, especially with the weather. Um, so they were able to use them a little bit more uh, consistently. So then, uh, based on our conversation with librarians in Maine, um, they all sort of had varied levels of success with the devices. In Kansas, uh, the wait lists were generally longer. The devices would go out for, for seven days. Um, and then in the focus group specifically, the, like, the patrons talked about having um, like multiple month long waiting lists, waiting lists 50 plus people. So there, were, there was a lot um, <clears throat> more waiting for the devices in Kansas. Um, in Maine, it didn't seem like, when the devices first came into the communities, they were often um, really popular and then did the usage kind of dwindled over time. And um, some of the librarians had really great success with using the devices and sort of working with um, the service providers in Washington County, but um, other librarians, particularly the ones in more remote areas, um, didn't have as good a relationship because, you know, they, they would be using the devices, they wouldn't be working, and then, um, you know, the, the tech IT people would say, no, they're working just fine in you know, the city, but they weren't working great um, out in the sort of remote areas. Uh, they had, sorry. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add to the other thing we found, I think, was certainly in Kansas, but might have been happening in Maine as well, is for, there are a couple of issues where the programs weren't successful. And on the one hand, um, if you have librarians who are not tech savvy themselves, you know, if they're not, not really comfortable with technology, then you find they're going to be less sort of willing to support a program like this. Um, and we think that there's, you know, some connection there between um, people's sort of comfort level with technology in the libraries and the success of these programs. So that's certainly one issue. And then, um, yeah, I think all, but, but then also another factor is just um, libraries that just saw the value and the need in their communities to, have, to, to sort of help provide access because there's such, you know, there's such high rates of, um, of uh, non-adoption of technology. So for those, you know, real, essentially those libraries were real champions. They really said, you know, we know our library, where our community is not connected. We see this program as an opportunity to address that need you tended to see more success like Stanton County, where they really sort of advocated and then also went out of their way to get additional grant funding to keep the program going. So, um, yeah, these are factors as well, I think, in terms of success and failure of the program. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we saw also in Maine that uh, the signal was not reliable in remote areas, uh, particularly Washington County has a lot of coastal islands and places where, you know, if you're on the opposite side of the island from the mainland, you can't, there's no signal for anything. Um, and that was a, a big problem. The devices weren't particularly useful in those parts of the community. Um, and because of the, the seasonal employment in Maine, um, the, it's often just impossible to pay for, for home broadband. Um, on the next slide, we talk a little bit about that, especially in the winter with heating costs. Um, you know, if you're not working um, the winter, which is the case for a lot of people in Washington County, uh, you know, having to heat your home in, in down east Maine at that time of year is going to be really, really expensive. So people will often um, just not have home internet and a lot of other things as well at that time. 
then... Yeah, so uh, like I said, the waiting lists were longer at the starts of the programs, um, but they, they tended to shorten as time went on. Um, and a lot of these libraries couldn't find funding for the devices after the program was over. Um, for uh, A lot of the librarians mentioned that it would be about $40 per device to keep them going um, per month. So that's, you know, a really high cost for libraries that have really small budgets to begin with. So a lot of places, you know, unless they, they were to seek out outside funding um, or help from community partners, you know, librarians mentioned a lot of ways that they thought about to keep the program going, but in terms of just, you know, setting that up and covering that expense, it's a really, really big, a big expense. Well, that's an interesting point, too, because the other concern that some libraries had is, you know, knowing, um, do people work in libraries here at all, or, yeah, okay. Um, Kind of, sort of. <laughs> um, you know, some of the concern for some of the libraries was, well, if we know it's a, you know, time, there's a certain time period on this, you know, sort of like doing it and then taking it away from people, um, some people were kind of hesitant to sort of, you know, try something, have people kind of get, you know, hooked on it and then take it away from people and then not know how to keep it going was a concern in terms of even getting started, you know, so that was also a fear mm -hmm. of getting involved. All right, so um, we're, we're sort of coming um, down. We're definitely going to open this up to questions that you might have about what we're looking at. But there's some other, so we're looking ahead, sort of thinking about, um, I should say these are all kind of early findings. We're still in the process. So the grant started in June, well, June last year. And so we're, um, and, and goes till actually technically January 2018. So we're still, the findings from the focus groups are, are coming in. Um, so this sort of early, uh, early findings that we're sharing with you, but we think, so as we sort of transition to think about what the implications of this research uh, um, uh, are on, on our field and what this means for libraries more broadly, we sort of have sort of three areas that we're right now just kind of thinking about in terms of how we want to share these findings and what type of a context. So there's certainly, I think, some interesting, you know, there's a lot of um, literature in our field on community outreach, community outreach strategies, how do we do that, how do we get more how do libraries be, uh, become and feel more connected to their communities, but this could be an interesting way to both um, connect with underserved uh, uh, areas of, of our communities that are not involved with the libraries by providing access through a mobile hotspot because it's essentially, you know, we're reaching people in their home, essentially, I say we, I'm not a library, but if, um, libraries who do this are able to kind of, you know, extend access into people's homes, which is a pretty huge deal. It's a really big thing. And actually, the interesting thing about that too is that um, not everybody agrees that should be the library's role. You know, should the library be in the business of providing home internet access is a, you know, is, is an open question. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we might be looking at, or I think we'll, we'll, we'll start looking at more, is this idea of, of connecting, um, you know, so for example, are there other programs that we might connect a hotspot to? Um, that help to do um, more um, community engagement with populations that are not as connected to the libraries. But also it's, you know, what does it mean for the existing public computing uh, facilities that, that rural libraries and other libraries have? Um, it, you know, are there, is there a way to think about programming differently in terms of the programs that happen in a space like this in a library? Um, you know, I think it has implications for digital literacy training in libraries. Maybe there are things that people can, you know, take a class in the library but then go home and practice things with their Wi-Fi device if they don't have access to home, then come back in the library. It's almost like a flipped classroom model, if you will, or not quite, but sort of. Um, you know, so I think there's interesting implications for what libraries are doing uh, in terms of their public computing centers. And then, and again, this is sort of connected, extending access beyond library walls. Um, also, broader questions around making the case for doing this, you know, in terms of a sort of a policy perspective. There's, you know, how do we convince local governments or um, communities that fund our libraries that we should, you know, that this is a good thing. Um, but also, you know, how do we gather data to show that these programs are impactful, especially if they're a short checkout window. So there, there continues to be a lot of really interesting questions around these programs, and these are some of the areas that we're thinking about, but we're open to your ideas as well. If you have any. So yeah, so we brought um, a couple copies. One of the outputs from this research that's already available and we just have two copies, but if you want to um, share them or pass them around. So one of the things that we did that's actually been um, fairly popular, or at least helpful, I think, 
is um, this sort of how-to guide. So for libraries, and it's not specific to rural libraries, it's sort of we're taking both what we're learning obviously from uh, the rural libraries, but I think some of what Sharon Strover, who again is the, the, the PI on the project um, at University of Texas at Austin, is working with the New York Public Library, you know, sort of saying, you know, what are we learning from these uh, hotspot programs and how can we help other libraries as they get started thinking about how to do a hotspot lending program, you know, trying to sort of um, bring up a number of concerns and issues for libraries as they think about, you know, what do I need to think about? It's, you know, how much is it going to cost? Um, who is it for? How do these things work? Really just trying to address some of the nuts and bolts issues. And so this is something that's available. We have a project website and a link to the website and the presentation that, um, uh, where this is uh, available for download online. So it's free for anybody to access, but it's based on the research that we're doing. So I know that the IMLS has been um, you know, pleased to see that this is a, a real uh, helpful and accessible output that the field can really benefit from. So there's lots of interesting information in that, but we're also interested in your feedback if you have any ideas on other things that we might include. And then these are some of the conferences and publications that we're, where we're going to be sharing this research. Um, so the, our colleagues in Oklahoma, uh, Brian Whitaker, who's at Oklahoma State University, will be presenting some of this research at the OLA conference. Um, and in the fall, we'll hopefully, our, we have a, um, a paper submitted to the Telecommunications Policy Research Conference. So the Washington Office of the American Library Association has also been interested in this as a sort of a policy um, in terms of the you know, sort of what are the public policy implications? You know, would this be something to um, where legislation could be created to you know help promote hotspot devices in libraries, or could this be considered within the E-rate program, for example? So um, you know, we think there are sort of federal policy implications as well for this research, and then there are a number of other outputs here. We have a, a, a blog post that Madison uh, co-authored on Daily Yonder, which is an online website around uh, issues related to rural communities in rural America. And so that was published. We have um, an article coming up in DLib Magazine, which is going to be Digital Libraries Magazine, which will be published soon. It's a special issue on the national digital platform, the, the IMLS uh, focus area that they're funding. So that will be coming out pretty soon. And then I think the other um, the other articles that we're, we'll focus on for probably later this year, early next year, um, probably the community outreach article we'll try to publish in uh, Library Quarterly, and then we, we um, obviously owe the IMLS a final report, which we'll have findings, but that will be publicly available as well, so where we'll be sharing additional findings from the research uh, in the shop. Yeah, so this is the, this is the project website. Um, this is a pretty long list, but a uh, pretty long link. But if people are interested, and also if folks here are interested, we can share these slides with you, or maybe, um, Lindsay, do you know if, maybe when the video comes out, we could put a link to, um, to our project site so people can see, um, learn more about this research. So. Yeah, I'd like to have in that description of the video? Or? Yeah, maybe in the description we can put, just put a link to our project site. Okay, I'll make yeah. a note of that. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so, but really, um, you know, just thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, we're, we'd love to open it up for questions. And, um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Do you have any data, anything? I know you said you have, like, urban libraries. You are, are you connected to those folks at all? I'm seeing what kind of differences and similarities there have been between the data in the urban areas and the rural areas? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. So the so this grant is only to look at the rural libraries. So this is a very, it's different from what um, Sharon Strover is looking at at the New York Public Library. But um, yeah, it's an interesting question. We've, we've talked about a few different ideas about, um, you know, how we can publish this research potentially alongside each other so we can look at rural and urban examples. But there, we don't have anything out yet that sort of talks about it. But that's a, it's a good idea in terms of, you know, thinking about, we were also at, some, at one point we were talking about maybe um, a, a book, publishing a book. And, and having different case case studies of these different libraries um, in a in a one volume that would might be helpful and perhaps we could include both the urban and the rural examples. But I definitely see the, the benefit of that. But we don't have anything necessarily yet that sort of you know compared both. I think if anything, it's the maybe the how-to guide that has sort of 
it's our attempt to kind of generalize regardless of location. Because I don't think it, it doesn't say rural, it's not focused necessarily on rural or urban, but I think it's, we've tried to say, you know, what are some of the core issues across all the libraries, all libraries that they might consider um, in, in doing these hotspot lending programs. And if you are interested in more information about the New York Public Library program and other sort of hotspot general type stuff, I would definitely recommend looking up Sharon Strober's articles and work and things like that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no, actually, thank you for bringing that up, Madison, because the um, actually the Benton Foundation did um, publish three articles on their website written by Sharon, and where she she first uh, I think started talking as an overview of the first three blog posts. The first is about New York Public Library, I think, and then shifted to talk about the rural context, but I don't know if there's if there's entirely a comparison, but at least it's nice to have that series together. Or if somebody wanted to like download all three and they're really short, um, you know, they could kind of see uh, examples from both settings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you said that one library in Kansas had some sort of previous. Um, Yeah, it was interesting. So in that case, that case was really neat. And I don't think we have any pictures, right? From Not in the slides, no. But we do have them on our site. That's yeah, that's right. They're on they're on this site. Um, yeah, it was really nice that they accommodated accommodated like workers, you know, and the people who were like, yeah, you because know, there's so many stories of you know the um, you know people pulling up their trucks after hours, right, and connecting the Wi-Fi. It's like the classic library access story. And um, so they said, why not build out this patio, you know, this sort of whole area to accommodate that. So it's really a wonderful story. Um, you know, the only other thing that kind of comes to mind um, that's not quite the same, but it's interesting to think about in the, so in Maine, in the one-to-one -one programs with the school, there was, there was some evidence where the kids would take their laptops from school and come sit outside the library to do homework. So there was that you know direct connection between just using local resources and infrastructure just to get homework done and you know whatever else was going on. But um, but also I think that it was kind of a nice um, to think about you know the device from the library, uh, sorry the the hotspot device from the library with the laptop from the school coming together right to provide the child with access or the the, the young person with young adult with access. Um, it's just a nice example of, for other communities to think about, about how schools and libraries can work together, because that conversation is always going on in our field, um, that where those resources are available, that's a nice example. But I don't, can you think of any other outreach sort of? I mean, in Maine, um, also, the, the librarian would go to the school um, yeah. to talk about the devices, to talk about um, sort of the library's resources um, at like the parent night like that, mm -hmm. uh, especially because of the, the sort of uneven seasonal employment. That was often one of the only places they could get everybody together was at like a school open house. So that sort of, that school library connection was also pretty apparent there as well. Well, and also there's the, um, did they have even um, like book return yeah, boxes? Yeah, the drop boxes. The drop boxes at, at the schools where they could drop the devices off also. So if a child checked out the device, they could, you know, just drop it off at the school, which is kind of nice. Um, but that was obviously in a smaller area. So, that's a great question. Yeah. Hi. Have you looked into how the libraries are budgeting for or finding funding for these programs? A little bit. A little bit. So um, so the obviously the context for these programs were that they were fully they were funded through the State Library Association. But as the programs came to a close there were lots of questions around, you know, how do we fund this beyond beyond the program. So um, there's, I think, just the two standout stories that we've been talking about is one, so with Stanton County Library, they applied for a grant, which extended the, not only, so they got more devices, actually, right? additional yeah. devices, and it allowed them to extend the program. But it was really, I think, enough funding for a year. Is that right? Right, so they would have to keep yeah. finding funding every year unless they were going to take it out of their book budget, which is something that yeah. some librarians talked about. like maybe as a potential, but something that would have been a sacrifice for the library to do. Right, right, absolutely. So taking out of the out of book budget. And so it was $7,000 grant to continue the program 
for one year with additional devices. So it's a lot of money for a small library. Um, the other thing that's really interesting and fascinating is that in Maine, there's actually legislation, state legislation, to out there that was introduced introduced to fund um, hotspot hotspot checkout programs in libraries. So they were able to advocate, um, you know, from these programs. I think it was uh, that well, so the Maine State Library um, and maybe some of the other local folks advocated for, you know, saying this is the value of these programs. It helps provide access. And so a uh, bill was introduced at the state level to see if they could fund these programs um, statewide. So that was pretty amazing, actually. Uh, we don't know what the status of that. We don't know how far it's going to get. But at least the fact that it was introduced is pretty interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are the two stories that kind of stick out. But um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the challenge is, is sort of it's the cost. But it's also, again, it's making the case. Right? Like, how do we make the case? How do we convince our boards? How do we convince our communities, local governments, that um, you know it's worth investing in? And one of the challenges, again, that we're having, we have a lot of focus group data. This is, you know, I think one of the few studies that exists. Hopefully, there are other researchers also looking at these now, these programs now. The more data we have, the better to understand what the value is, so we can sort of show our communities if, if these, if and when these programs are working that libraries have access to data to help make the case that these programs are valuable for the communities. So, um, yeah, it's all, but it's all still new, I think, in general. It's sort of a, it's still a new concept. I think. Even though libraries have been doing, you know, it's been several years, like maybe two or three years, but in general as a concept, I, um, it's just kind of catching on across the country, I think. So there's lots more that we want to um, learn from what's going on. So, yeah. Anything else? All right. Um, well, thank you so much for coming and listening to our presentation. And uh, if you have any other questions, you can contact us. Our contact information is also on the site. And I also, my office is upstairs. All right. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you.